Hey there students, Tom Ritchie here, and it is time for the night before a push. We've got the a push exam happening tomorrow, at least for a good bit of, uh, you know, good bit of you. Okay. And if y'all are here, let's see, uh, see who's here. We've got Kevin here. We've got, uh, we've got Vicki and her students here. Um, Sue has here. Now we've got a couple of things going on. We've got some of you watching on YouTube. And if y'all want to come into the crowd cast, y'all are welcome to go into the description and join us on the Crowdcast. Now, at the same time, you can also uh, stay on YouTube. You know, you can do any of these things here. Um, so just uh, watch it wherever you want. There are two chats going, and I could not be happier about this, okay? And actually, let's see. So this is actually the link. Uh, my actually, I don't know if it's actually going to the right thing. So let me just, uh, let me go correct the link in the YouTube real quick. Just give me just a second here. And uh, we will, uh, you know, we'll fix that. But anyway, actually, just go to Crowdcast. I owe Tom Ritchie. You know, that's fine. So going from there, ladies and gentlemen. OK, so we're here and it is the night before a push and we are ready for uh, we are ready for this. Now, first of all, a couple of words from our sponsors. OK, and Vicky's here. We can really get started. OK, some words from our sponsors. First of all, my app, Romulus A Push Review. It's just a little trivia app. I'm not working many miracles here. But I do think that this is something that's nice and helpful for $2.99. This is something that you can, uh, you know, just review. You can go through a whole list of topics here. You know, what is it that you're weak on? You can go through here and then it's going to ask you some things like, okay, do you remember the intolerable acts? You know, what were the coercive acts called and that sort of thing. So it's just a simple little trivia app, but for $2.99, I think that it's great. Now that's POV me. That is at the app store and Google Play. Romulus A Push Review. Now, we also want to note that Marco Learning has a lot of free resources. If you go to marcolearning.com, um, they've got study guides. There is a study guide for each uh, unit, so you can go to history guides. Now, also note that Marco Learning provides uh, support in a lot of different areas. Some of y'all who are in the chat can vouch for uh, Marco Learning's products, uh, you know, and their services. They're really great. Also, if you want to take one last practice test, you can go to practice test. You can download a free AP US history practice test with answer explanation. So make sure that you know that's out there. Now, also, if you go to crowdcast.io slash Tom Ritchie, and if you're on YouTube, you can just click in the video description. At 10 p.m., I'm going to be doing a fireside chat, okay? Now, this is a premium thing here. Only a couple people in there right now, but it's capped at 30. So, you know, just understand that at 10 o'clock, I'm going to be doing a small group review. We've got hundreds of people that are going to be in here tonight, but this is going to be limited to 30 people. So there's information, those of you on YouTube, the fireside chat. Okay. So we're going to be doing like FDR. Now also, uh, you know, youtube.com slash Marco learning before the fireside chat, I'm going to be on Marco Learning's channel for a bit, okay? So we wanna know they're at 15.9, let's get them past 16,000, okay? I really wanna see that happen. So let's go ahead and make sure that that happens. Uh, Marco Learning's YouTube channel, make sure y'all are subscribed to that. They're at 15.9, we'd like to see them um, get a few hundred more subscribers. So with that, I'm gonna go into Crowdcast and we are going to see what our most popular questions are. Okay, what should we do if we don't remember enough info for the DBQ. Now, my first and most or LEQ rather. Okay. So we get to the LEQ and it's like, oh my goodness, like none of these are any good. Now, if you can't get like at least a two on the on one of those LEQ topics, like you know nothing about any of them, you got bigger problems. Okay. You're probably not going to pass the exam, like to be quite honest with you. Okay. Hopefully there's something there where you can get at least a couple points on the DBQ. I mean, on the LEQ, <laughs> you know? So basically though, remember that the DBQ is worth 25%. The LEQ is worth 15%. If you can write a really strong DBQ, like let's say theoretically you look at 
all three of the LAQ topics and you're just like, oh my goodness, face palm, like these are awful, but the DBQ is good. Okay, so let's think about this. Well, oh my Lord, y'all keep the chat, y'all keep the chat, uh, you know, y'all keep the chat appropriate. Um, so let's go ahead and go to a push score calculator. Okay, so let's see what, well, let me show you what my friends at Albert IO would have to say about this. Okay, now, um, you know, Albert IO, they would say that attempt all of the sections, but let's think about this. Let's say you got, uh, you know, you got 30 out of 55 correct, okay, on the multiple choice, you know, five out of nine, and then let's say you got a five on your DBQ, okay? Now, as far as that goes, you could not write the LEQ and still pass the exam. So if you get to the LEQ and you're like, there's nothing here that I can do. Now, here's the thing though. I think you can at least get two out of six, okay? Because really to get two out of six, all you would really need here, you know, a push LEQ rubric, okay? So when it comes to the LEQ, in order just to get a couple points here, OK, in order to get a couple points here, then you would write a thesis. And for the first thing here, OK, so this is something really important. Evidence one provides specific examples of evidence relevant to the topic of the prompt. So the thing is, this point is a giveaway point. OK, this is one of those things that, you know, it doesn't have to support an argument. It just has to be relevant to the topic of the prompt. Note here two or more specific historical examples going farther than name dropping. So the thing is with the LEQ, with the time that you have left after your DBQ, now the college board recommends 60 minutes for the DBQ, 40 minutes for the LEQ. I think it's fine to go 70, 30, because unless you're trying to get full credit on the LEQ, I would spend a little more time on the DBQ, make sure you get like at least five points there. If you are for a five point DBQ is something that fortifies you against failure. It makes it very hard to fail this exam. And so with that, I would focus on the DBQ and then on the LEQ, just keep writing keep writing. It's just like throwing something at the wall and seeing if it sticks. Okay. So when it comes down to it, if you don't know how to write an LEQ, uh, you know, write what you can and just write as much as you can until, you know, until you're out of time and then see if it, because basically the reader's job is to go through here and find any points they can. So it's like, okay, they just wrote something there. That's relevant. Okay. And that's relevant. Therefore they get this point. They constructed a thesis. That's relevant. Oh, you know what? I think they use some causation here kind of unwittingly. You never know what you might get. OK, so with that, that's my best advice. If you just run into the LEQ and you're just like, I have no idea what's going on here. OK, and so as far as that goes, somebody would like a history of our political parties. OK, so if we're thinking about this, a history of political parties. And let me uh, go ahead and shout out to Tyler and Coco there on YouTube. I think that is, uh, you know, awesome. Y'all are over there and uh, getting ready for a push. Y'all keep up the amazing work there. Um, let's go ahead. If you're finding this helpful, go ahead. If you're on YouTube, give me a thumbs up. OK, that's uh, something that will get that make this thing a little bit more visible. So going from there, let's think about this. Yes, the writing is uh, important. Uh, you know, that's uh, that's coming straight from Vicky, the teacher, not the Vicky, the student who's about to make a five. So going from that, let me uh, let me go over. I think that the political parties are great. OK, so let's think about this here. We're going to look, first of all, at Jefferson versus Hamilton. This is one of the most important topics um, in this course because it reverberates. OK, there are after effects of this um, going throughout U.S. history. OK, so with this, let's go ahead and get into Jefferson versus Hamilton, the first two party system. OK, so now remember that initially there were the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists that were arguing about whether to ratify the Constitution. Hamilton, Madison, J. James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, John J. Federalist Papers, writing on the suit under the pseudonym Publius. Now, the first two party system, Jefferson and Hamilton, they are, uh, you know, they're basically this is after the ratification of the Constitution, because remember that Madison, Hamilton and Jay, they're saying like, look, the Constitution's safe. You can ratify the anti-federalists are saying, no, this Constitution is going to create a national government. It's going to be too powerful, all that kind of stuff. Um, but once the Constitution's ratified, 
then we have the first two party system. Now y'all remember, I'm going to be doing some Instagram shout outs. We got some of y'all here um, that may not be following me on Instagram yet. I'm going to be doing some Instagram shout outs here and there as well. So at Tom Ritchie on Instagram, um, make sure y'all are following at Marco Learning as well. They've got some great stuff. And so with that, the first two party system, 1791 to 1816. And so basically it starts during the Washington administration and it goes through the war of 1812. So the Federalist Party is Alexander Hamilton's party. Now note here that this is distinct from the Federalists that want to ratify the Constitution, even though Hamilton was one of those two. Now also, it is distinct from the concept of federalism, okay? This is very important here because federalism is where we have the federal government and the state governments each with their own sovereign authorities, okay? So as far as that goes, that is <coughs> very important there that we think about you know, we think about this, okay, that the Federalist Party is opposed to the concept of federalism. And then there is what Jefferson called the Republican Party and what we either call the Jeffersonian Republican Party or the Democratic Republican Party. I prefer to call it the Jeffersonian Republican Party, so that I'm going to do that. Um, it's more likely your exam will probably use this terminology, but it's all the same. But keep in mind, not the same Republican Party as exists today. So with that, the first two-party system, on one hand, you've got Hamilton and John Adams with the Federalists. Now note here, remember, like I said, James Madison was a writer of the Federalist Papers, but then he joins his BFF, Jefferson. When you go to Monticello, um, Jefferson's house, there's actually a room called the Madison Bedroom because that was, you know, James Madison and Dolly Madison, they were the most frequent guests there. And so with that, Federalism, okay, what is the relationship between the states and the central government? The Federalists supported a strong central government, while the Jeffersonians, they supported states' rights. Now, one thing that you want to know, you don't want to memorize all of these little boxes on their own. Think about how this tells a story, okay? So basically, all of these things go along with a political philosophy. So they want, the Federalists want a strong central government because they are afraid of anarchy and mob rule, okay? So as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, um, that, uh, that with this, they don't want anarchy and mob rule. They see this as a strong central government is going to stop that. Whereas, you know, Madison and Jefferson, they're more afraid of tyranny than they are of anarchy and mob rule. And so with that, when we look at the Constitution, okay, how do we create a strong central government? Loose construction. Now, I never use Comic Sans unless I'm talking about loose construction, because this is basically where, you know, the Constitution is just a guideline. You know, it's a living document. You know, we'll just kind of, you know, we'll just roll with the punches. Whereas Jefferson, strict construction. The Constitution is the Constitution, and it is a contract between the states. You know, the way Jefferson and Madison look at this, it's kind of like, you know, if my car note, you know, it's like when I bought my car, I agreed to a certain car payment. What if the bank says we're changing your car payment? No, you know, it's just, no, th this was the agreement. You know, the bank's not going to say, oh, you know what? We said it's going to be around this much. And, you know, it, no. We made an agreement. And so with this, you think about how loose construction, why is the Constitution, why is Hamilton wanting to construct it loosely? Because loosely constructing the Constitution gives room for implied powers, which lead toward a strong central government. So the support base, the commercial elite tend to support uh, Hamilton, whereas we see more rural support for Jefferson. Now, government involvement in the economy. Hamilton believes that the government has a role to play in bringing about, you know, in having a more, uh, you know, basically, you know, encouraging of the manufacturing economy. Jefferson says, no, I'm laissez-faire. The government needs to stay out of the economy. The government and the economy are two separate things. And so then the whole idea of a national bank. Now, this is the most important uh, part of this. OK, so as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, um, that uh, awesome HMK knows that Hamilton was very, very passionate about the National Bank. Now, the National Bank never shows up in the Constitution. 
Coco Banks, okay, on Instagram, who just gave me a follow there. Uh, you know, her name, she's got bank in her name, I guess. But the thing is, no matter, I mean, neither the National Bank nor Coco Banks is in the Constitution. And so with this, you know, this is the whole point of loose construction, because then we have room for a national bank. Because Hamilton's like, you know, the Constitution says you can borrow money, you can coin money, you can tax and spend money and all that. Jefferson says no, okay, because the bank is not in the Constitution. We look at the necessary and proper clause. Jefferson says the word necessary. That's important. And then Hamilton's like, well, you know, there's nothing like immoral about it. So what's the big deal? And so going with that, um, then we see things like Hamilton supports a protective tariff. Hamilton wants to assume the, the war debts of the states. Um, you know, Hamilton is more, you know, he likes the British more, Anglophiles, whereas Jefferson and Madison are more partial to the French. So that is the first two-party system. And hopefully, um, Carlin and Jacob and Caroline Hastings and Emily Trask Ryan St. Lawrence. Ryan, you've been in a couple of these things. Thank you for your support. And uh, my eye is uh, is here. Uh, psych ward patient number 56. That sounds interesting. Um, and uh, Kayla is here. Tyler, um, Rach, and uh, D underscore Martin 53. Emma Nicole with a bunch of periods there. Um, chicken steak 13. That is interesting. All right. Thank you all for the support. And uh, for good luck, definitely like that recent post with Harambe. Just remember that uh, you know, Harambe died so that you can do well tomorrow. All right. So with that, we'll note that the first two party system was really broken up by the war of 1812, um, that the Hartford Convention caused people to, uh, you know, it basically, you know, caused a lot of Americans to look at the Federalist Party as unpatriotic and suspect. Now, as far as that goes, when we're looking at the War of 1812, speaking of that, um, let's think about Henry Clay's American system. Um, let's see here. Okay, so let me just, uh, let me make a little uh, little thing here because it's time to get into Henry Clay's American system, okay? So with this, um, let me note here how the War of 1812 um, had an effect on the economy of the United States. And it looks here um, like, uh, let's see who's watching on YouTube. Looks like Madison Grace is here and she says, hey, Arica and Maggie is here and uh, somebody else is here with Maggie. I'm not gonna name that one. Uh, Mason is here, um, Rap Maggie. Thank y'all so much. And Coco is here. Hey, Austin. All right. So with that, uh, hopefully, oh, thank you, Michael Castillo with that super chat. Mm, mm, mm. Somebody just got $2 richer, y'all. All right. So with that, let's go ahead and get into Henry Clay's American system. All right. So looking at that, um, Henry Clay's American system, and hopefully we'll see if CBD's out there. Um, she might be at the Marco Learning Student Support Session, but uh, Henry Clay's American system. Now, when we look at the Jeffersonian economic model, Jefferson, you know, he wanted no manufacturing. Hamilton wanted manufacturing. Jefferson's like, look, manufacturing is dirty and filthy, and it breeds dependence on the government. Keep it in Europe. We'll send them raw materials, and they'll send us finished goods. It'll be kind of like before the American Revolution, except we can trade with whoever we want. Remember, Jefferson was a big fan of agriculture. Those who labor in the earth are the chosen people of God, okay? And that's what we see here. Now, Jefferson, trade was essential for Jefferson's model to work. But then we think about like the impressment of sailors and uh, you know the War of 1812, it halts our trade with Europe. And so the thing is, what are we going to do? Okay, the War of 1812, can we really have an economy that is exclusively dependent on trade? And Henry Clay says, no, we got a problem. We got to nip it. All right. And now you could say pen, but you don't want to do that because you can spell pen P-E-N. Speaking of which, bring a pen tomorrow that you like writing with um, that is legible ink. Don't bring like a pen that's like light blue glittering or something like that. But you're going to have to write your SAQ, DBQ, and LEQ in pen. Um, some people didn't realize that in the last session. Now, those of you taking online exams later don't have to worry about that. But Henry Clay's American system. First of all, National Bank, okay? He wants to recharter the National Bank, which had expired in 1811. So the second National Bank. Internal improvements. He wants infrastructure, roads, bridges, canals. 
and the protective tariff, okay, to support domestic manufacturing. So with that, it's a very Hamiltonian plan, but Henry Clay, he wants to see the United States build a national economy, self-sufficiency, internal trade, development of Western lands. Um, and so with that, Henry Clay is imagining um, an America, you know, where we are have an internal trade that is not depending on Europe, you know, the American system, not the foreign system, as he calls it. Now, with that, y'all let me know in the chat. I have a website, by the way. Um, let me know in the chat if y'all want to hear my American System song. I actually wrote a little song about the American system to the tune of Adam Sandler's Lunch Lady Land. I'm going to get my guitar just in case y'all want to hear it. Um, but if y'all don't want to hear it, you know, I just won't play it. But if y'all want to hear a song about the American system, y'all let me know in the chat. And let's see here. We've got 431 watching on YouTube and only 24 likes on this video. So let's get some likes up there. Um, I should see at least like 50 or 75 likes if I'm going to, you know, if I'm going to play the song. And then some Instagram shout outs while I get my guitar. Devon underscore C, Connor underscore Garen, Simar underscore K, a bunch of underscores. Um, link period summer. Um, thank you for, uh, you know, for helping us out here. And, uh, you know, yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Tom Ritchie fans, like some account that just got there. Killer Keenstar and Lawrence Chung and uh, all of that. Thank y'all so much for your uh, LNK con. Um, we've got so many of y'all who are doing, uh, you know, doing such, uh, such great work out there. Okay, so going from uh, going from there, uh, we've got uh, Abigail Kim and Alyssa. We've got some girl named Haley D underscore Martin fifty three, and then Tom Ritchie fans and Tom Ritchie fan page. And um, okay, so uh, so yeah, going from there, a lot of stuff. Thank you, Zoe and Morgan Salo, living the life, man. I tell you what, she is living the life uh, out there. I mean, that is. That is a life out there. I tell you what, uh, happy they're happier than a seagull with a French fry. How happy is that? I mean, gosh, she is living the life out there. Okay, living the life, man. All right, let's see what we've uh, what we've got here. If we've got uh, some more, uh, hopefully we got some more likes. Those of you on YouTube um, are uh, liking it. Okay, so y'all want me to sing the song? All right. Well, hopefully we get a few more, uh, you know, a few more likes uh, going on that uh, on that YouTube page. R.I.P. Harambe. That's right. That's right so with that ladies and gentlemen let's go ahead and sing this song here i should have uh i should have tuned my guitar saloon went to the house of representatives with my pal john c calhoun this embargo isn't helping us protect ourselves well it looks like madison finally listened and now we're in the war of 1812 Turns out we weren't as prepared for war as I thought we might have been. The British burned down the White House, much to our chagrin. Sure, it ended well at New Orleans. Yeah, that was quite a win. But for our economic future, we need to focus within. Oh, whoops. <laughs> well, yesterday's economy was based on foreign trade. If we can achieve economic independence, then we'll, we'll have it made.
Internal improvements, internal improvements. National Bank, National Bank, National Bank. Internal improvements, internal improvements. National Bank, protective tariff rots off. Steamy boat, steam, steamy boat, yeah. Steamy boat, steam, steamy boats and built off. Western roads, west, western roads, yeah. Western roads, west, west. Well, I woke, I dreamt one morning that I woke up to see The United States had built a national economy Jimmy signed in the law, a second national bank Supporting economic growth, and y'all got Henry Clay to thank Then internal improvements, Richard's roads and canals Could connect all the sections, gonna make us all pals A protective tariff to build home industry our economy won't have to count on British sympathy. Why cross the Atlantic, travel out of our zone? Well, we can build factories and make stuff right here at home. I know the South's not eager there. No, they're not on my side. Because they got grow cotton for the world and they ship it far and wide. In 1828, they said that tariff's too high. John C. turned on me and Carolina nullified. But I said to Calhoun, you got nothing to fear. Ship your cotton up north and we'll process it here. The American system is pursuing the goal to build a a home economy free from foreign control and ride some steamy boats, steam, steamy boats, yeah. Steamy boats, steam, steamy boats, and build some western roads, west, western roads, yeah. Western roads, west, west, west. Internal improvements, internal improvements. National bank, national bank, national bank. Internal improvements, internal improvements, national bank, protective tariff rights on steamy boat, steam, steamy boat, yeah, steamy boat, steam, steamy boats and built some western roads, west, western roads, yeah, western roads, west, western roads, built some western roads. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Henry Clay's American system. All right. So we'll, uh, now that's on my SoundCloud. If y'all want to hear it again, um, that is on SoundCloud, Henry Clay's American System. All right, so y'all are liking that. Remember, National Bank, Internal Improvements, Protective Tariff, and remember the steamy boat, steam, steamy boat, yeah. Now that is, uh, that is something that is a nod to the commercial revolution, okay? The commercial revolution that we see happening, okay? So the commercial revolution, we see steamboats, turnpikes, canals, uh, you know, the cotton gin, you know, all of these things that if you took AP Euro, like the first industrial revolutions. All right. Yeah. Y'all like that. Y'all are going to remember those. Uh, see if y'all put steamy boats on y'all's uh, DVQ or LEQ. Uh, steamy boat and steam, steamy boat. Yeah. All right. So now let's go and see how does Henry Clay's, um, you know, idea of a national economy, how does this fit into things? Okay. So when we think about that the South really doesn't have anything to benefit from this. And, you know, Henry Clay, of course, is, uh, you know, opposed to Jackson. Now, when we're looking at this, let's go ahead and look at the development of the second two-party system, okay? So with that, when we're looking at the second two-party system, we had the Federalist and the Jeffersonian or Democratic Republicans. Now, from 1816 to 1824, you had the era of good feeling, okay, where you had one party. Um, this is where you had so much good feeling there. Um, just like I've got, uh, you know, just uh, Ellie Poplar is full of good feeling over there, going on a like spree over there. And, uh, you know, so with that, you know, Liam Harm, good feeling. I wish no harm on you, buddy. And Berkshire, I.B., and uh, Thailand, uh, you know, 10 and all four L-O-V-E. All right. So we've got uh, Marissa. Thank you all so much. And Colton B. Thank you. And Nate. All right. So with that, so much good feeling out there. OK, so the era of good feeling during James Monroe's presidency is just such a, uh, you know, such a happy time because you don't have the two party system. Now, the thing is that what happens is with, uh, you know, 1820 
28, what we're going to see here um, is you have these, this Republican Party kind of splits between the national Republicans and the Democratic Republicans who they just kind of shorten that to Democrats. And then you've got the Whigs. Now, the Whig Party, they are naming themselves after a party that existed in Britain. So what they're saying here is that the Whig Party is saying that we are the party like that's against the monarchy. You know, Andrew Jackson was a very powerful president. He used Jackson vetoed more pieces of legislation than any other president. OK, and so what we're going to note here is when we look at the second two party system, we see here the Whigs and the Democrats. So like Henry Clay being one of the biggest leaders of the Whig Party, Jackson, of course, the founder and leader of the Democratic Party. Federalism. Now we're going to see some things here where, you know, Clay is more nationalistic with the American system and let's build a home economy free from foreign control and ride some steamy boats. You know, that's Henry Clay. Whereas Jackson is, you know, there's a lot to say here comparing Jackson's viewpoints with Jefferson's, but also, you know, that Jefferson, you know, was a bit of an aristocrat. Okay. So when we think about some of these things that the Whigs tend to be more elitist, Jackson was democratic. Jackson and the Democrats believed that the so-called common man, you know, that this person could have a role in government. Um, and so moral reform, you know, Whigs were more likely to support things like temperance and abolitionism, whereas the Democrats not so much. Now, Henry Clay, loose construction. Okay. The constitution's kind of a general guideline, whereas Jackson and the Democrats, they believe the constitution should be interpreted strictly. And so the economy, you know, basically Clay believed that, you know, like Hamilton, that the government should be involved in economic development. That's the whole thing with the American system, you know, internal improvements, internal improvements, national bank, national bank, national bank. So we see here that Clay is a fan of government involvement, whereas Jackson is laissez-faire. Now, uh, we see here that the Whigs have their base in the Northeast. They've got some Western support, but basically the Democrats are much stronger the farther South and the farther West. Now, the American system is a very contentious thing at this time. And so on one hand, you've got Clay's party that's like, yes, 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 National Bank, Internal Improvements, Protective Tariff. Whereas the Democrats are like, no, no, well, depending on where you're from. OK, because note here that northern Democrats, um, they are more likely to support the protective tariff, whereas southern Democrats are less likely to support the protective tariff. So that's something that we want to note here on um, that that is kind of depending on where you're from. And so remember, the Whigs, they saw Jackson, uh, you know, when we look at Jackson um, in the bank, you know, Jackson's like the bank is trying to kill me but I'll kill it, um, you know, and the thing is POV analysis. If you're looking at Jackson, you know, Jackson believes, notice in Jackson's bank veto message that the largest word here is states. And you note that United doesn't appear as big. Jackson writes in his veto message when he vetoes the recharter of the Bank of the United States, Jackson writes that the bank as it exists in that charter is not constitutional and it is a violation of the rights of the states, that it grants too much power to money elite. Um, it is not something that is a necessary power of the government. It is something that serves its stockholders um, more than it serves the people. You know, Jackson is somebody, even though Jackson's a laissez-faire guy, I think Jackson is really like our first like populist president in the sense that, you know, there's a lot of this language that you could see Bernie Sanders using, you know, that Jackson does not trust the banks, the financial sector. He believes that the second bank of the United States is making the rich richer at the expense of the self-made man. And so with this, we see that the Whigs, uh, you know, of course, this isn't going to happen for too much longer, I don't think, but the Whigs, they've got this political cartoon, King Andrew the First. And of course, notice here that they've got Andrew Jackson trampling on the Constitution of the United States and, you know, over internal improvements in the National Bank, National Bank, you know. And so he's using this as a king, like he's got his veto. Now, the thing is, if you ask Jackson, that Jackson would say, 
I'm vetoing unconstitutional legislation. There's nowhere in the Constitution that a national bank shows up. And Jackson says, especially not this bank. But this is a Whig POV cartoon. Remember that visual sources, they have POV, okay? That you have to know that visual sources are trying to uh, communicate something. And this is saying that Jackson is abusing his power with the veto, whereas Jacksonians would say, that you know he is uh, you know he is not abusing his power with the veto that he is right on uh, you know the money here so to speak so with that uh, you know we've got uh, oop, all right so yes yeah, so I do have a wrap on the compromise of 1850 now that's been a little while but uh, let me see um, okay so 1850 wrap. Okay. I've got a folder here, um, compromise of 1850 wrap. I haven't done that one in a while, but I'm not against it. If I can find the, uh, you know, I just need to find the, you know, let me see if I've got this. Warm water records. Oh gosh. Okay. Now that is, I just need the, uh, I, I don't know where I've got the actual, oh, here it is. I think I've got it here. Okay. I think I can do that. I think I can do that, but I need to have the, I need to find the lyrics. They might be on my SoundCloud. Okay. So SoundCloud, um, Tom Ritchie, let me see if I've got them on there because I just need to find where the lyrics are. Okay. So yeah, I'd be glad to do the compromise of 1850, uh, you know, the compromise of 1850 rap. So let me see what I've, uh, what I've got there. Um, Okay, so compromise of 1850 rap. Okay, let's see what I've uh, what I've got there. And so with that, yeah, I, okay, actually I do have this. Okay, so let me get to that in a little bit. Okay, some people are saying in the chat they want to hear. Now I'm still only seeing 24 likes on the uh, on the YouTube thing. YouTube chat, y'all get on there. So y'all want to hear some rapping? Now I'm not a rapper. Okay, I'm not a rapper. <laughs> what is it? Um, <laughs> oh, WTF is a push, bro. Uh, you know, and then we see uh, see here, hi, Austin, Jimmy, the spoil system. Yeah, Andrew Jackson just basically fired everybody. Yes. Okay, a rap OMG. Okay, so we hear that Mar Bear wants to hear that. Maggie Lowry says she's, she's scared. Okay, so let's see. Um, what we're going to do with this. Yeah, Snap is Tom Ritchie SC. Uh, Y'all are welcome to add me, uh, you know, add me there. Um, but let's see what we've got on the Instagram, uh, you know, here. And uh, let's see, Armando Gazzano, thank you so much uh, for that. And then uh, the hammer. All right. So we've got, oh, okay. So yes, uh, Ellie still sending those positive vibes out there. Okay. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and, uh, and see how this goes. Tom Ritchie for president. That's funny. I'm not running. All right. So let's go ahead. The, uh, you know, the compromise of 1850. Okay. So let's see here. Okay. Warm water records. All right. Let's see. I'm not a rapper. Okay. Y'all got to bear with me here. Okay. So let's see what we've got here. 1850. It's a national obsession. What is Congress going to do with the Mexican session? Let's admit California as a single free state. Southern congressmen unhappy. Some are really irate. Stronger Fugitive Slave Act to secure some Southern votes. Such a controversial measure. People at each other's throats. Squatter sovereignty out West. Let the settlers decide. In New Mexico and Utah, Congress need not take a side. Gonna bail out the Texans, pay off debt from their war, just as long as they're not claiming Santa Fe anymore. Finally outlaw the slave trade in Washington, D.C., but we're gonna stop short of a ban on slavery. All right. Y'all wanted to hear it. Okay. So with that, I would tell y'all not to laugh, but y'all go right ahead and laugh. Okay. And that sounds like a wonderful segue into the, uh, you know, into the compromise. Oh, yeah. They want me to rap again. Okay. That's not, uh, let's, uh, let's stay away from that. Um, but let's just go ahead and note the compromise of 1850, which that's something that I tend to, uh, you know, that I tend to, 
Uh, let's see. So let's go ahead and run on to the Compromise of 1850 and noting that that's something that is coming out of, uh, you know, and this is something I've got a proper lecture on as well. So I would I would say definitely, uh, you know, you want to um, take a look at that lecture. If you got time tonight, uh, remember to watch the ads and all of that good stuff. Now, also remember, ladies and gentlemen, we've got the fireside chat tonight at 10 o'clock. I've actually only got like, there are only like two people in there right now, but uh, at 10 o'clock PM, there's going to be a fireside chat. And if you're on YouTube, you can sign up for that. It's limited to 30 people. Okay. So, uh, you know, if more than 30 people, you know, only 30 people can be there. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and put a little link to the fireside chat. Um, in the Crowdcast. Now, if you are on YouTube, um, there is a link in the description to the Premium Fireside Chat. That is a small group, 30 people or less, um, live review. So that's going to be something there. So with this, uh, you know, on YouTube and on Crowdcast, Cameron is uh, going hard out there. And remember, Romulus A Push Review is at the App Store, okay? And it's a little trivia app um, that I came up with there. Let's see how Marco Learning's doing on YouTube. I'm going to be going on that channel at 930, a little bit before the fireside chat. So let's go ahead and check on Marco Learning there. And they were at 15.9. Have we added anything there? Let's see what's going to happen here. Let's get them over. Come on, y'all. Get them over 16 or else I'm going to end this thing early. Okay. So by nine o'clock, they better be over six. We can get them to 16.1. Come on now. All right. So with that, we want to understand that the Mexican War happens. There is the Mexican-American War, the Mexican War, whatever you want to call it. So the Mexican Session, that is in 1848. Now, that is the context for uh, the Compromise of 1850. Okay, so what is Congress going to do with the Mexican Session, you see? And so with this, a national obsession, what is Congress going to do with the Mexican Session? Now, we want to note free soilers are coming around, okay? So abolitionists have been around since the 1830s, but abolitionists, even in the North, people are like, get rid of slavery entirely? That's crazy. Um, but with that, free soilers say, we don't want to get rid of slavery. We just want to stop the spread, okay, so to speak, which y'all can, uh, can be familiar with that kind of mentality, right? That the free soilers, they want to stop the spread. And so with that, uh, you know, they put a mask on it or whatever, you know? So with that, abolitionists, they want to get rid of slavery everywhere and now for moral reasons. Free soilers want to stop the westward expansion of slavery for reasons that tend to be more racist and economic. Um, so they're both anti-slavery movements. Now, also, those of you on YouTube, if you're not subscribed to the channel, make sure y'all do that. Um, and so the Wilmot Proviso, because remember, I provide support for AP U.S. government as well, or if you're taking AP Euro as a senior, I'm here for y'all. Okay, so the Wilmot Proviso, it is a free soil manifesto, basically nothing in the Mexican session, no slavery in the Mexican session. So that's that's what they have there. Now, it never passes, but it's basically a line in the sand from the free soilers. And so what happens here with the Compromise of 1850, you got Henry Clay and Stephen Douglas playing shake and bake there, um, that the five provisions there are, first of all, admit California as a free state, okay? Admitting California as a free state, then a stronger fugitive slave law, popular sovereignty in the Mexican session, letting the settlers decide, Texas letting go of its Western land claims in return for money from the federal government to pay off its war debts, okay? And then finally, abolishing the slave trade in Washington, D.C., but not slavery itself, okay? And so as far as that goes, now I think that it's best if you kind of put this together in like groups of two, like you think about, okay, California is a free state. Now this ends the practice of basically free state, slave state, free state, slave state kind of stuff here. And so the South doesn't like this. Southern congressmen don't like this. Well, what are you going to do for them? A stronger fugitive slave law. So for, you know, members of Congress from Virginia, from Kentucky, from Maryland, from Delaware, um, these states that are close to the North, um, they want that additional support, basically moving enforcement of fugitive slave laws from the federal government to state governments. Now in the New Mexico Territory, 
popular sovereignty in the Mexican session, meaning that the settlers will decide the status of slavery rather than Congress. Okay, so as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, um, we see, okay, what are we going to do here? Then the federal assumption of, uh, you know, Texas debt and Texas ceding its Western land. So these two are going to settle what's going on there in the Mexican session. And then slavery in Washington, D.C. abolished the slave trade as a compromise between those who favor slavery and those who don't. Basically, Southern congressmen can still bring their, uh, you know, their body servants into the Capitol, but there aren't going to be slave auctions that are going to be an embarrassment um, to the country, you know, when you've got foreign diplomats and people like that. So, so the Compromise of 1850. This is something that is, uh, you know, that's going to become controversial. The fugitive slave law is going to be the most controversial part of this, okay? Because that's what's going to bring in all of these debates that we're going to uh, that we're going to see uh, that we're going to see there. Um, so going from, uh, you know, so going from that, um, that's a little on the compromise of 1850, okay? So as far as that goes. Um, let's see where we're, uh, you know, where we're going from that. All right. So yes, good night rest and a good breakfast. Yes, definitely. Okay. And so with that, what are some specific treaties and tariffs that we should know? Okay. So as far as that, I'm going to name a few just off the cuff here, Jacob, um, that I'm going to say, first of all, you've got the Treaty of Paris 1763 and the Treaty of Paris 1783. Those ended the French and Indian War and the American Revolution respect respectively. Okay. So that's, uh, you know, that's easy. 1763, 1783, both of them in Paris. Uh, now, also a Treaty of Paris, 1898, ended the Spanish-American War. Now, as far as, uh, you know, of course, the Treaty of Versailles is a big deal because that has so much uh, of a debate in the Senate over this. So that's something that is, uh, you know, that's something important there, I believe, um, that we're seeing that, uh, you know, we're seeing that in the Senate. Um, so, so going from there, some tariffs. I would say that the two most important tariffs are going to be the tariff of 1828, which is going to cause the nullification crisis. That is the so-called tariff of abominations. Okay, so that is one of the uh, you know one of the biggest uh, you know one of the biggest tariffs. Uh, or actually the largest, okay, that the tariff of 1828 is the largest protective tariff in U.S. history, okay? So when we think about the nullification crisis, that's what we're going to see, uh, what we're going to see happen because of the tariff of 1828, that it's basically the American system's dream here. Now, what we want to note here, this is another thing that we need to think about in terms of you know, a revenue tariff versus a protective tariff. Okay, so the tariff of 1828 is known as the tariff of abominations, highest tariff ever passed by Congress, and a protective tariff, it is a tariff that is in excess of the necessary money to finance the government. Okay, so that's what we're dealing with with a protective tariff. Now, Put it in your head one more time uh, that the revenue tariff, okay, a revenue tariff is a modest tariff that exists to help the federal government raise tax revenue, whereas a protective tariff um, is a higher tariff to protect American industry from foreign competition, okay? And so with that, uh, you know, so with that, um, this is something that is a different goal here. And there is a discussion about is a protective tariff even un, even constitutional? Now, the tariff of 1828, you don't know, you don't have to know um, the particular uh, the particular tariffs, uh, you know, the particular tariffs that are passed during the Gilded Age. But we do want to note that during the Civil War, a high protective tariff is passed, and that doesn't go down until the Progressive Era. So when we're thinking about this, we don't necessarily need to know like the specific names of tariffs. But when you're thinking about for example, uh, you know, the populist, okay? And we're thinking about the populist party um, that they are, you know, they're wanting, uh, you know, bimetallism, but they're also uh, not fans of the protective tariff. So William Jennings Bryan, for example, 
um, when he gives the cross of gold speech. What he says here, if protection has slain its thousands, the gold standard has slain its tens of thousands. And so we see here he's making a biblical reference, like if Saul has slain, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. And so the protective tariff uh, is something, the protective tariff and the gold standard are the two things that William Jennings Bryan is taking aim at in 1896 when he becomes the Democratic nominee and basically gets nominated on a populist platform. You shall not press down upon the brow of labor, this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. And so that's where the populist, you know, they are saying that we want, you know, we want a lower tariff for revenue only. And then we also want uh, a graduated income tax to, to replace that unlimited coinage of silver. Now, the populist also wanted the nationalization of the railroads. They wanted the government to take over the, op, you know, the operation of the railroads. They never get that. And they never get that. OK, now graduated income tax. And a lot of these things here, the progressives actually pick up, even though the progressives aren't farmers, they're middle class urbanites, but they're going to pick up, up some of these things because the progressives, uh, they also feel that they benefit from a greater amount of popular democracy. And so going from that, we want to also note on um, the Hawley Smoot tariff or the Smoot Hawley tariff. OK, I think we're done with SoundCloud for the night. Right. Um, you know, so the Hawley Smoot tariff. This was passed during the Depression. Now, one of the things that, you know, it's like when we talk about the causes of the Great Depression, we have to think about that the government did some really stupid stuff. OK, the government did some really stupid stuff during this. And so with this, let me actually I've got something here on causation that I'm going to share in the, uh, you know, in the chats. We're going to share those uh, that in the chat. We've got some uh, some causation stuff here. And so let me uh, let me go ahead and I'll share that in the, uh, you know, in the chat on Crowdcast. And then we'll run over to YouTube and we'll share in, the you know, in this chat as well. OK, so we'll go ahead and get over here and we're going to uh, we're going to share that over here. So uh, a Google Doc where we go into the causes of the Great Depression. Now, I've got a lot of stuff here, but one of the things here when we think about is like Herbert Hoover did some really stupid stuff um, that when we're having an economic crisis, Herbert Hoover's like, hey, how about a tax increase? You know, so we can make sure the budget's balanced. And it's like, what? And then a tariff increase, the Holly Smoot tariff or the Smoot Holly tariff. It, you know, it's like one of those, it is interchangeable. But what is not interchangeable is that this was a disaster, okay? That basically, Herbert Hoover's like, oh, you know, the economy's bad. Let's pass a high tariff and let's protect American jobs. And, you know, the thing is, politicians, they think about jobs, but they don't think about the overall freaking economy. And, you know, it ends up just being a disaster. So this is a tariff that I would say is one of the most important here, because one of the things that causes the Great Depression is just wrong actions by the government. OK, wrong actions by the government, um, you know, because it's like the economy's like, you know, we need some GDP, you know, you're down with GDP, uh, you know, yeah, you know me, but Herbert Hoover's not down with GDP, okay, that he wants instead, he's like, we need to protect jobs and, uh, you know, so that's one of those things. Now, remember, Hoover did things. He didn't sit around doing nothing. FDR painted Hoover as doing nothing. Um, you know, Hoover, Hoover did things. He just did the wrong things. Of course, FDR also did some of the wrong things, you know, like when you think about the three R's, relief, recovery and reform, FDR's New Deal provided economic relief for people who were suffering with programs like the CCC, you know, the Civilian Conservation Corps. I would think about... Um, I would think about knowing like three New Deal programs going in tomorrow. And the CCC is like one of my favorite New Deal programs is I like to go to parks. And the CCC is, uh, you know, this is something that is, uh, you know, they're going and they're building like, you know, bridges across creeks and, you know, going into national parks and like building stuff. And what's happening is these boys, you know, these boys and young men, they live in camps and they get paid 20% uh, of what they make. 
And then the other 80% goes home to their families. Okay. So their families are getting economic relief, but their sons are out there working. Actually, in some cases, their daughters, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, got some uh, what they call she, she, she camps. That's a little harder to say. It doesn't quite roll off the tongue, but there were actually some, uh, some CCC camps for boys. Now, another thing is that uh, to note that although FDR did not uh, pursue civil rights legislation, um, FDR did make sure that there were black CCC camps, like this economic relief was going to Americans regardless of race. And this is where when we look at the party system of the United States. Uh, the New Deal is where we start to see like a realignment of black Americans from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party. Now, one thing that we'll note here is election of 1904, if we're looking at this now, remember during Reconstruction, the Republican Party, um, you know, you had radical Reconstruction in the South. It took uh, white Southerners a long time to make their peace with the Republican Party. Um, that they, you know, that you see here, this phenomenon is called the Solid South. Um, that basically you see an election after election that the, you know, that the South is voting Democratic. Even when the country as a whole is in a Republican mood, um, we see here that now, of course, Woodrow Wilson, uh, you know, wins. So when the Democrats win, it's not so obvious. But if we go to the like election of 1928 for, you know, let's go to 24, 1924. And we want to note that, Coolidge, you know, there's Coolidge prosperity. Coolidge is a very popular president, but at the same time, that prosperity is not really hitting the farm economy, which is still, you know, a big part of the South. And so you've got the solid South phenomenon. Now, you know, with this Coolidge prosperity, one thing that happens in 1928, you actually see the Republicans like, you know, the country is doing so well that, you know, you've got even some of these Southern states voting Republican. Now also note here that Al Smith was the first Catholic nominee from either party. You notice how Massachusetts and Rhode Island, the two most Catholic states in America, um, are voting for the Democrats and then the deep South here. But then other states, I think that you probably are looking at a situation where they're, you know, the Democratic nominee being a Catholic is not, you know, necessarily helping, but there's also a really booming economy. And so that's something here that, uh, you know, as you go into 1932, though, that is where you've got a major realignment that FDR creates this coalition of, uh, you know, of basically, you know, Southern whites, uh, you know, recent immigrants, uh, you know, Northern uh, Union members, and then also Black Americans are joining the Democratic Party at that time. And this is like this election, he just trounces Herbert Hoover. Now, this New Deal coalition stays together until, you know, after uh, World War II, where the Democratic Party becomes, uh, you know, becomes very supportive of federal involvement in civil rights legislation, which starts to alienate Southern white voters. Now, one thing that we want to note here is the Great Migration. OK, so when we look at the great migration um, of black Americans uh, outside of the South. OK, so we see here that uh, with the great migration, you have a large amount of black Americans in northern cities. Now, they are not uh, they are not welcomed um, in these places, but at the same time, they are outside of the South and they are voting in these, uh, you know, in these elections. And so what you see here is this is like, you know, the first great migration and the second great migration. But as far as that goes, that we see a realignment after um, the after World War II. And of course, that's where you see, like, for example, you know, the 1972 presidential election where Nixon has applied his so-called Southern strategy and Nixon as a Republican gets a 49 state victory. Now, that's the funny thing about Watergate. The funniest thing about Watergate is in what election was breaking into the other party's headquarters less necessary than it was in 1972. It's like when you're leading by this much, you know, this is almost like, you know, if a football team, you know, were like, you know, five touchdowns ahead, you know, had like a 35 point lead in the fourth quarter and they've still got all their starters in there. OK, that's the kind of thing that we'd be looking at here. And so with this, let's see if we've got any new. Uh, we've got Jimmy Music and Simply Harmony. 
Um, and simply and Sydney Reyes, thank y'all so much. Uh, which I think Sid's been actually following me for a little while, so that's been uh, you know been great of you to uh, to do that. And so with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you know, going from here, um, let's go ahead and see what we've got as far as the next question. All right. So going from there now, as far as that goes, remember, I'm going to be going over to Marco Learning's channel at 930. And then after that, I'm going to have a little fireside chat. Now, Marco Learning's up to 16K. I'm glad to see that. Let's see if we can get them to 16.1. Uh, now, remember also Romulus A Push Review is the uh, you know, is the uh, be available at the App Store. Now, great, we've got here that, uh, you know, we've got Vicky going through the, uh, you know, through the reconstruction and progressive amendments. Okay, so going from there, um, we've got a question here kind of looking at ages of reform. Okay, so Jacob is asking questions about, you know, just generally ages of reform that happen, uh, you know, before these things. Okay, so as far as that goes, what are the major similarities and differences between early reform movements? Okay, so if we think about when we think about like, you know, abolitionism and temperance. Now, I think that the early reform movements and the progressive movement, definitely they have some things in common. Now, the early reformers in the antebellum period, abolitionism, temperance, um, and then also, uh, you know, women's suffrage. Now, we see those things, uh, you know, abolitionism um, is, you know, is accomplished by the Civil War, but then we think about temperance after the Civil War becomes prohibition. You know, women's suffrage, uh, you know, becomes, you know, becomes more of a thing. And so when we look at that as, uh, you know, as Vicky's going through the progressive amendments, you know, that the 19th Amendment recognizes the right of women to vote. Um, and then, you know, of course, you've got the 18th Amendment prohibition, which was, you know, the progressives are like, hey, government can be a positive force, um, you know, through things. And uh, that's something that is, you know, the government, uh, you know, in some cases, you know, hey, the government, you know, what a great uh, what a great idea. Um, you know, when we're thinking about, uh, you know, we're thinking about some of these things in terms of the uh, you know, in terms of, you know, we're thinking about some of these things in terms of some things government does well, um, you know, but some things not so much, um, you know, so with that, uh, with that, I need to, uh, you know, I need to go find something with the New Deal and the Great Society because somebody's asking about that because that's been on some things, uh, you know, on some things before. OK, so so with that. OK, so. Okay, so let me go ahead and, uh, you know, let me just run in here real quick and see what we're going to be able to, uh, what we're going to be able to find here. Um, so with that, let's see what we're, because uh, I've got something that I did with the Bill of Rights Institute, I believe, that I went into, uh, went into some of these things. So let me just, uh, let me go ahead and note, uh, and note there. So my drive, just running into my Google Drive and thinking about, um, Let's see. Maybe that was uh, maybe that was yesterday. So let me see if I. Yes, I did do something there on the Bill of Rights Institute stream. I was talking about um, the you know the New Deal versus the Great Society. So let me kind of show you what I have uh, what I've done here um, with that, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, share that in the chats. Okay, so let's go ahead. We got uh, Pog in the chat here. I am uh, sharing some stuff. So let's see where we're going from uh, where we're going from there. And so the New Deal versus the Great Society. Now I shared this. Um, yes, yeah, sleep is uh, is important. You know, sleep is important. I would say getting a good night's rest is very, very important here. And so with this, let's go ahead and, uh, you know, I've got, uh, you know, here the, you know, that the New Deal versus the Great Society. Okay. So the New Deal in the 1930s versus the Great Society in the 1960s. Now the New Deal, we've got basically new government programs. Okay. So we see here Social Security and the New Deal, Medicare and Medicaid. Um, then we see here, I mean, basically Medicare and Medicaid are building on Social Security. Now, note here that most New Deal programs required some sort of work to be done in return for the relief that people got. 
Um, so as far as that goes, that the Great Society programs really did not require work to be contributed in order to receive them. Um, the New Deal laid a foundation for a more expansive role for government in addressing poverty, whereas the Great Society built on the foundation of the New Deal. Um, then the New Deal provided economic relief for minorities, okay? But note here that when we think about like unemployment reached a high of about 25%, um, then we've got here that, uh, you know, that we see here that minority, like, you know, black unemployment reached 50% during the New Deal. And so with that, um, you know, with that, what we're seeing there is that, um, you know, this is something that is a big deal. And, and note that even without FDR going after civil rights legislation, um, you know, the black community is very, very appreciative that FDR is doing something, okay, to, uh, to address their situation. Whereas the Great Society includes civil rights legislation. Okay, so uh, so we see here civil rights legislation, which includes uh, you know the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and 68. Now I would pick one of those so you don't get them confused. Okay, so I would learn a little bit about one of those. Civil Rights Act of 1964 basically bans discrimination in employment, whereas 1968 is the Fair Housing Act. And then in 1965, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which is designed for the federal government to crack down on some, uh, you know, on states that are trying to uh, put up unnecessary barriers to voting. Now, both expansions of go both involved expansions of government. OK, basically, you know, so both involved expansions of government in order to help the poor. Both were opposed by conservatives who referred to the programs as socialist, um, you know, and then they did not eliminate the problems they were created to solve. Now, I would note here argumentative, but defensible. OK, and what we want to note here is when we're thinking about the DBQ and the LEQ. OK, so we think about a push, you know, DBQ. DBQ rubric. OK, so when we're thinking about the A push DBQ rubric. Um, what we're thinking about, uh, what we're thinking about here is that, uh, you know, that this is something that when we're looking at the A push DBQ rubric, note that your arguments, they there's nuts, you know, when it comes to history, you know, it's like there are facts, but then there are arguments. And when you're making an argument historically defensible. Now, to make this clear, one thing that we're going to note here is A push course and exam description. OK, so if we're looking at the A push course and exam description, um, what we're going to find here is when we're looking at the New Deal. OK, um, this is really one of those things that I mean, it just says straight up in the course and exam description that the New Deal did not end the Depression. OK, so basically, when we think about relief recovery reform, that the New Deal was a failure as far as FDR's promises to bring about F to bring about economic recovery. There's some debate about, you know, if there hadn't been an international crisis in 1940, would FDR have been elected to a third term? But to note here, relief recovery reform, it left a legacy of reforms and regulatory agencies and fostered long term political realignment. Um, and so what we note, uh, what we note here that, you know, it created this coalition. But even today, like when we look at the FDIC, if I walk into a bank and I don't see this uh, this logo, I'm walking back out of that bank. I'm not putting money in there um, because the thing is the FDIC, that means that um, the government is guaranteeing that even if this bank goes under, that this is going to be something that, you know, depositors will get their money back because that bank had paid insurance in the FDIC. They'd agreed to open their books to, to auditors. And so with this, you know, that even though creating the FDIC didn't end the Great Depression, it created some, some long lasting stability in our banking system. OK, and that is something that is very important there. So again, and then the Great Society, you know, Lyndon Johnson declared war on poverty. I mean, how's that going? Okay, I mean, we haven't exactly, 
gotten rid of poverty in this country. So the thing is, you know, you can you can make arguments like, you know, your arguments are not true or false, but defensible or indefensible. So when I'm looking at the New Deal and the Great Society, I'm seeing here that, uh, you know, they did not eliminate the problems um, that they were created to solve, even though they may mitigate, they, have, they may have mitigated them, I could say, you know, so even though they may have mitigated them. That's a fancy word for, uh, you know, made them a little less, uh, you know, a little less uh, harsh. Okay. They might've done something here, but they did not eliminate the problems that they were created to solve. So you want to know some specific stuff here about what's being created. And then of course, uh, you know, what we've got, uh, you know, what we've got here as far as similarities, there was a question about that a few years ago, I believe an, uh, an SAQ. Okay. So that's something to, uh, something to note on that. So going from there, um, you know, we see, uh, we see here, um, you know, that, um, Okay, so let's see what we've got as far as some things, uh, some things here. Um, I tell you that, uh, you know, that fireside chat, uh, we've got uh, just a few people in there right now. I wonder if this thing will, you know, hopefully it'll still be uh, be happening. But remember, that's my plan for 10 o'clock to be doing, you know, in FDR fashion, a fireside chat with a, you know, with a small group uh, of people, preferably people who aren't on the East Coast, because really at some point, you East Coasters, y'all need to go to bed, even though I know some of y'all are going to, you know, or y'all are going to stay up um, for a long time. So when we think about the Gilded Age, okay, one thing, Izzy, when I'm thinking about the Gilded Age, I am, you know, constantly thinking in terms of uh, that, you know, a lot of people, I think, falsely refer to the Gilded Age as laissez-faire, okay? Um, you know, who put the dislike on the YouTube? That is so funny. Somebody, you got me. Uh, we got, uh, gosh, the ratios are great, but, uh, you know, one of those, uh, you know, somebody got a dislike on there, uh, which is great. Oh, Carrie A Nation, I tell you, with the hatchet, yeah. Um, can we talk about the shady Gulf of Tonkin incident? Actually, you know what, Austin? We definitely can. Y'all remind me, but let me talk about the Gilded Age for a little bit first. So the Gilded Age, people talk about as laissez-faire, but the thing is, laissez-faire means that the government's just stepping back and doing nothing. And so what I ask here is that, uh, you know, is a protective tariff laissez-faire? No, it is not. A protective tariff is an intervention by government to help big business. Um, were the transcontinental railroads laissez-faire? No, the Pacific Railroad Act, it made a partnership between the government and corporations. And of course that ends, you know, that ends up having some scandals like Credit Mobilier, where somebody makes a shell corporation and people start defrauding the government. The Gilded Age is a period of extremely corrupt government in the United States. And so when we think about laissez-faire, sure, government wasn't doing a lot to regulate business, even though we do see the Sherman Antitrust Act, even though it's weak and it would be used more against labor unions than big business. It is a regulation. The Interstate Commerce Act, which establishes the Interstate Commerce Commission to begin to regulate the railroads. Um, so the thing is that it's often characterized as laissez-faire, but what I say is that the government tended to be on the side of big business, okay? And then you think about is the government, is the federal government sending in military, okay? So if you think about this, uh, that is the, uh, you know, is the government sending in the military, um, is that uh, to put down a labor, uh, you know, a labor strike, is that, um, laissez-faire. No, I don't think so. And so going from this, I think that that is something that is very important to, uh, you know, very important to note with that as we're going, uh, you know, as we're going through this. And so I think that that there's a lot to be said that the Gilded Age is, you know, what a lot of people are, you know, upset with and the political machines like the Tweed Ring, you know, people are tired of this stuff, you know, that it's not just the government sitting back and letting whatever happen. You know, this here, there is the perception. When you look at Puck Magazine, um, which was a magazine that was read by people who tended to lean Democrat and were working class. Um, in 1889, the bosses of the Senate. This is not laissez-faire. This is basically the government taking orders from big business, from these trusts. Now, these trusts 
What a trust is, is when basically a bunch of businesses in the same sector that should be competing, they get a board together, okay? And they they have a common board. They make common policy. It's basically collusion between these different businesses. And so with that, you know, people are getting tired of that. They want to see some regulation and they want to see the government not take sides. And that is why when you look at, uh, you know, when you look at Teddy Roosevelt, okay? So the, uh, you know, Roosevelt, square deal okay so the square the square deal um you know teddy roosevelt is just basically saying that you know we're going to protect consumers we're going to control corporations conservation of national re natural resources you got the three c's here right the three c's of roosevelt square deal and then the new deal the three r's but basically roosevelt when there's the anthracite coal strike and roosevelt says Y'all come to the Oval Office, you know, come to the White House and let's chat. The business leaders weren't happy about that. But Teddy Roosevelt's like, look, it's not up to the government to always take sides with big business. The government is for everybody. Um, you know, that it's the people's government, not the government of the corporations. And so another thing to note is when we're talking about uh, philanthropy. OK, that's something that I think is uh, is important there. Um, this is an old slide. Y'all forgive me. It's got clip art. Uh, this is embarrassing. Um, but as far as that goes, philanthropy, education, public health and the arts. Um, so if any of y'all have ever have, have never had yellow fever. Thank you, John D. Rockefeller, for investing in public health. OK, when we think about, uh, you know, education, uh, you know, Carnegie Mellon University, uh, the University of Chicago, uh, John D. Rockefeller provided the uh, the money to get that started. Spelman College, um, a historically black women's school in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, that was uh, named for John D. Rockefeller's wife. Her maiden name was Spelman. So, you know, how much was the government or mainstream society trying to do to educate black women during the Gilded Age? So the thing is, even though philanthropy may be to, uh, you know, help to revive uh, the images of these uh, entrepreneurs, uh, you know, they made some great investments. Uh, you know, the arts, Carnegie Hall in, in uh, you know, New York City. Um, if any of y'all are applying to Vanderbilt University, the Commodores, they're named for Cornelius Vanderbilt. So understand like the philanthropy, I think is very important, uh, very important as well um, during this period. Okay, so that's something that we want to, uh, you know, that we want to make sure um, to note uh, to note with that. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you know, going through here, those are some highlights of the Gilded Age. Now, what was the thing that I said that we would talk about uh, that the um, gosh, what what was it? Um, that I said we were going to talk. Oh, the Gulf of Tonkin. Okay, the Gulf of Tonkin incident. I actually took a Vietnam War class um, with uh, with Dr. Edwin Moise, who literally wrote the book on the Gulf of Tonkin incident. And what he did is he interviewed like the sailors who were aboard the USS Maddox. Okay, and so the thing is that he said that you know more like the majority of the crew. Now, right after the incident happened, the crew was basically like we got attacked but after they had some time to think about it the majority of the crew that dr moe's like interviewed they said we don't think there's an attack but the people who thought there was an attack they were more adamant that there was an attack and so the thing is dr moe's said when you think about like that on one side you've got the majority and on the other side you've got a greater degree of certainty he did some studies in mathematics early on so he thinks like very technical and so you put these together and you know you've got basically a 50 50 split but dr moe's in the latest edition of his book on the gulf of tonkin incident he comes to the conclusion that like it didn't happen like that ship was not attacked and we need to think about the point of view first of all he has you know he's a professor at a university with a doctorate and a recognized i mean literally wrote the a to z dictionary on the vietnam war on the other hand too that his book is published by like the naval institute press and so we see here that this is like the press of the united states navy so this is very interesting to see how like the gulf of tonkin incident you know led to um a you know led to this uh,
Gulf of Tonkin resolution that basically gave a blank check, okay, it gave a blank check um, to Lyndon Johnson and said, do whatever you're going to do. You know, you can do whatever. But with that, it's, yeah, it's, it's somebody said, you know, the suspect Gulf of Tonkin incident, definitely so, okay, that's, uh, you know, that's something there. Now, um, now, actually, I'm going to. Yeah. So it's really interesting to think about that, that the incident that sparked um, the blank check for Lyndon B. Johnson to do whatever he wanted in Vietnam, uh, you know, and bring in the whole military industrial complex. Uh, you know, this is something that, uh, you know, that. Dr. Bowies has concluded did not happen. Uh, you know, so it's very, very interesting. So with this, um, Suha, you ask a really good question. Um, difference between the social gospel and the gospel of wealth, they are not the same thing. Okay. So the gospel of wealth is is there with philanthropy. Okay. So the gospel of wealth is there with philanthropy, whereas the social gospel is a movement uh, that is it is trying to combine elements of Christianity and Christian teachings with socialism. OK, so on one hand, the social gospel says that the wealthy have an obligation to invest in society. Whereas the social gospel says that Christians have an obligation to help the poor and a lot of advocates of the social gospel would be for let's tax those suckers and get their money and use it to help the poor. So that's something, yeah, the social gospel and the gospel of wealth are not the same thing. Andrew Carnegie, as far as I know, he was not a religious man. John D. Rockefeller was. Carnegie was not. So understand that there is a difference between the social gospel and the gospel of wealth. Leo, I'm sure your notes are just fine. Okay. But yeah, but yeah, Carnegie wrote a book called um, The Gospel of Wealth. Now, one thing, Chloe, that I always uh, mention when we're thinking about, you know, Unit 8 is that, uh, you know, the women's movement after World War II, or actually in the 1960s, it's not right after World War II, um, but in the 1960s, Betty Friedan, uh, you know, she publishes The Feminine Mystique, okay? So The Feminine Mystique, um, is the book that Betty Friedan publishes that starts um, really second wave feminism. Okay, so what we're going to note here about second wave feminism, first wave feminism was about like getting the vote. Okay, so first wave feminism is about getting the vote. Whereas second wave feminism is like, Okay, we've uh, you know we've gotten the uh, you know we've gotten the vote, but it really didn't make much of a difference in society. Okay, so we've gotten the vote, but how much difference did it make? Like you know, in the 1960s, is a woman going to be taken seriously as a doctor or an attorney or anything like that? Okay, so as far as that goes, when we're thinking about uh, second wave feminism, it's like okay, we have the right to vote, but we want to be able to pursue a career if we want. We want access to. Uh, you know, job opportunities to the professions, you know, to university professorships, uh, you know, medicine and law, and also, you know, things like birth control. Now, Betty Friedan was a founder of the National Organization for Women. Again, second wave feminism, uh, the feminine mystique, and the National Organization for Women. Now, the National Organization for Women, uh, you know, women's rights, feminism, uh, reproductive rights, civil rights, LGBT rights. Uh, you know, notice that the National Organization for Women tends to cater to women who are left of center. Now, they were big into, um, you know, advocating for the Equal Rights Amendment, which was in the 1970s. This was was an amendment that received, uh, you know, two thirds of each house of Congress, but was never passed by the states. Like it was actually kind of held up. And what's interesting here is there is another women's movement that's happening at the same time. And this is a movement of uh, conservative women. Okay. So there is, uh, you know, you've got Phyllis Schlafly, okay? Now, Phyllis Schlafly founded an organization um, known as the, uh, you know, the Eagle, the Eagle Forum, which that sounds very, very patriotic, okay? So the Eagle Forum, um, you know, which she was a big, uh, she was a big, um, supporter of Barry Goldwater, you know, was a very big uh, participant in the conservative movement. And so the Eagle Forum, you know, caters to conservative women. And what happened here is Schlafly in the 1970s, she is launching the Stop ERA campaign. So this was actually a group of conservative women. Stop ERA, it means 
stop taking our privileges. Now, the thing is, there's always this question like, why would women not want the ERA to pass? Why would women not want equal rights? Well, here's the thing. If you ask Schlafly and other conservative women, and this is what I, the question I always put to my classes is, uh, you know, I ask the young ladies in my classes, I ask, do you want to be drafted? Like, do you want to be forced into the military if we go to war? And nearly every, uh, you know, every um, female in the class is like, no, I don't want to be. I, I don't want to be drafted. And so what we see here is if the ERA were to pass, what Phyllis Schlafly and the Eagle Forum are arguing is that this will actually mean that there are ways that the ways in which women, um, according to them, actually get preferential treatment are going to be abolished and you're going to see women forced into military service. So I think that it's important, and this comes up in the course and exam description as well, um, is that you know, understanding that they're, you know, the rise of the conservative movement and what happens with that. And note that there are some states that actually like ratified the ERA, but for, due to advocacy of, uh, you know, Phyllis Schlafly and other conservatives, that they rescinded their ratification. So you can see here like five red states, you know, now they're not red on this map, but they're red states, you know, Kentucky, Tennessee, um, then we've got uh, Nebraska and South Dakota, and then uh, you know Idaho, which uh, Idaho. All right, so uh, so with this, uh, you know, I want to say Utaho so bad, but it's just like I'm not going to. Um, but as far as that goes, uh, you know, that's what happens to the ERA, and it's actually conservative women that are at the uh, you know at the forefront of this uh, of this movement to stop the ERA. Thank you so much, uh, Amber Bartley, for uh, the most recent instagram follow who is carlo dv i wonder who this guy is uh you know who is this guy he's got a dog uh so there we uh there we go there we go and so uh you know we know who carl odv is or carlo dv or whatever um so with that thank y'all so much for this now make sure that y'all are following uh marco learning um as well and that y'all are going to marco learning's youtube channel so remember a few things that you're going to uh you're going to have here um that i'm going to be on marco learning's channel if we gotten them to 16.1 yet okay let's get them up to 16.1 um, if y'all want this, uh, if y'all want that uh, review session with Marco Learning. Now, remember, I've got the fireside chat that's going to be happening at 10. Looks like that's going to be a very small group. So whatever questions you have, I'm going to be around for that. Even if that uh, group is very small, I will be there at that, uh, you know, at that small group session. And then looking here at Romulus, a push review is on the app store. Now, remember, I'm not working miracles. I'm not, you know, healing lepers or raising the dead. It's just a little trivia app. But I think it's very, a lot of people have said it's very, very helpful in studying because it makes sure that you know the content and the content is at the bottom of all of these things. So, you know, make sure that you are going to follow me over in a few minutes to Marco Learning's channel. Okay. Because that's where I'm going to, uh, that's where I'm going to be. All right. And Evan, I love you too. I love you too. And this is where, uh, all right, Laza is ready to be drafted in the military. I tell you what, so uh, so there we go. Um, comment their snaps and make a GC. Uh, my snap is Tom Ritchie SC. If y'all are wanting and wanting to follow, I don't I don't really use Snap too much, like for a public story, but you know whatever. And so the market revolution, Prisha, I already went over that when I was saying Henry Clay's, uh, you know Henry Clay's. Uh, American System song, you know, steamy boat, steam, steamy boat, yeah, steamy boat, steam, steamy boats. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Joe's Productions. Joe's Productions, I tell you, that guy, as far as cram videos, um, you know, Joe's production is, uh, you know, is excellent here. Um, would I please go briefly over Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois, okay? And so the thing is, when we look at, uh, you know, Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois, somebody's asking for the link. I'm presuming the link to the fireside chat because y'all want to join me for that uh, premium small group uh, session there at 10 p.m. Eastern. Um, so we'll go ahead and uh, yeah, and we had uh, we had Heimler uh, on one of our broadcasts last week. So yeah, a lot of play, a lot of great places to go for last minute a push review for sure. Um, and so with that, the transcendentalist Henry David Thoreau um, note individual responsibility 
And the and that includes the ability to use your own judgment to question the laws. Like basically, Thoreau was a big fan of civil disobedience. If there's an unjust law, um, he's going to oppose it. I will do one last round of Instagram shout outs before this is all over. And we're also going to be shouting out, out at the Marco Learning Instagram, you know, at the Marco Learning broadcast in just a little bit. So uh, Shmia, the will to win 39. Hopefully you got a will to win tomorrow. Um, Nadi Tanik, um, Katie Joe Larkin, Loopy, uh, AJ Kirk, 39, Johnny D. Um, and uh, yeah, thank y'all so much for uh, the gestures of support. So Booker T. Washington, W.B. Du Bois, um, that the early, the turn of the 20th century, was basically the low point of American race relations, okay? The low point of American race relations. And the question is, what do we need to do about it? It's like, basically, you know, black Americans don't have money and they can't vote. And so which one of these needs to be done first? So Booker T. Washington believes that it's no use. He looks back on the experience of Reconstruction and he realizes that political power like, you know, during Reconstruction, Black Americans had, uh, you know, had full constitutional rights, political power and all of that kind of stuff. And so with that, they had this uh, this political power and it was just yanked away from them. So Booker T. Washington says we need to focus on he says the ballot that matters most is the green ballot. And that's what he said in his Atlanta exposition speech, often called the Atlanta compromise speech. So that's something, you know, he's talking about the green ballot. And so as far as the green ballot, um, that's something here where, you know, he's uh, he's talking about in terms of the green ballot, that that's the one that matters. Now, W.E.B. Du Bois says that, you know, money is not as important as political power. And while while Booker T. Washington founds the, uh, you know, the Tuskegee Institute, W.E.B. Du Bois is a founder of the NAACP. And W.E.B. Du Bois says that we need integration. We need voting rights. Those are the things that need to happen first. So if we're going to compare the two, what we want to note is these are two well-meaning people who are trying to, uh, you know, help the black community and people of color in general, and they are trying to uh, improve things. But what comes first? And that is their biggest disagreement here. You know, and it, to the Tuskegee Institute, Booker T. Washington says that we need to teach people a trade. Like basically, you know, people would learn academics at Tuskegee, but they also need to learn a useful skill. And all of the buildings at the Tuskegee Institute um, were um, built by students, like all of the buildings are built by students. So they're learning skills there. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'd love to see some more uh, subscriptions at Marco Learning. I'm going to go ahead and cut this off, but we are going to be on Marco Learning's YouTube channel. I'm going to be there with John Muscatello, and I'm sure y'all are going to get a, a look at Marco the dog. That is the big selling point. Like Marco the dog will likely make an appearance at this. So go ahead. This is not, you know, we're going to be making this in just a couple minutes. And so within a few minutes, we will be going live on Marco Learning's channel to continue this. And I'm going to be looking at the chat and see what's uh, what's coming up there. So as far as that goes, ladies and gentlemen, best of luck, everybody. Go ahead and feel free to follow me to Marco Learning. Remember Romulus A Push Review. And remember at 10, I'm going to be doing that small group fireside chat session. So with that, ladies, and gentlemen, I'm uh, just uh, yeah. Understand we've got uh, we've got that. Also, Marco Learning's got free practice tests, so all kinds of places to go there. And you know, y'all are mentioning some excellent YouTubers. Uh, you know, Joe's Heimler. You know, just so much stuff out there. And you know, just great to be part of such a supportive community. And uh, you know, and again, I'll do some more. Uh, you know, be doing some more shout outs with uh, with Marco Learning as well. And I'm really looking forward to what we're uh, you know to what we're going to see there. So with that ladies and gentlemen, have a good night. And remember, it is always a pleasure.